pants this time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So today starts a sermon series on the Ten Commandments. And you'll notice in your bulletin, I have a little chart here. And the way that we count the Ten Commandments changes by the tradition that you're a part of. So, for example, Catholics count, well, I need to start. There are 13 statements that make up the Ten Commandments. All right? And in Hebrew, it isn't actually Ten Commandments. It says Ten Utterances, Ten Sentences, Ten Statements. There are 13 statements strictly speaking. But they're always grouped differently depending on the tradition. So Catholics and Lutherans take the first three statements and lump them together. Those are, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods before me, thou shalt not make unto thee any image or idol. So those three are together in the minds of Catholics and Lutherans. But to Calvinists, to the writers of the Septuagint, and to uh, modern Jewish people, the, these, two statement, these three statements are broken up into two groups. So uh, Jewish tradition breaks them up with the first statement, I am the Lord thy God, being the first commandment. While the second two are grouped together, thou shalt have no other gods before me, thou shalt not make an idol or image. Whereas uh, Calvinists and the Septuagint lump them the opposite way, where I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods before me are grouped together. And thou shalt not make an image or idol stands alone as a commandment. Now, the two groups of tradition will either lump these first two together or the or the last ones together the last three which all have to do with your neighbor so the last three statements thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife or his slaves or his animals or anything of thy neighbor so these three are grouped together variously You'll notice that the Talmud, the Septuagint, and Calvinists all group all three of these together as one block of commandments. And the Lutherans and Catholics disagree about how to group them together because Exodus and Deuteronomy take those first two statements and they flip them in order. And so the Lutherans follow one order and the Catholics follow the other. And that's the problem of grouping these last three separately, is you have to figure out which, do you follow Exodus or do you follow Deuteronomy in the ordering of the commandments? So the Catholics say that thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife stands alone as a commandment. The Lutherans say thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house stands alone as a commandment. But the Talmud the Septuagint and the Calvinists all agree that these three stand together. And that will be a whole different sermon. But today I want to focus on the first three. The first three statements, not the first three commandments. I'm actually going to end up grouping these very, in various ways as we go through the sermons. But the first three, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods before me, Thou shalt not make unto thee any, any image or idol. And throughout scripture, these are actually um, intimately connected with the seventh commandment. Thou shalt not, excuse me, thou shalt not commit adultery. And it's really interesting to me that these are grouped together that way. But we see in the Psalms, we see in the book of Jeremiah, the illustration of Israel as an unfaithful wife to the Lord God. And God variously says that idolatry, it, well, the Lord variously likens idolatry 
to adultery. But they're two different. But they are very different things. Very different. But from God's perspective, they're not. And I want to bring it to idolatry again because we do still have idolatry in our day and age. Now, on a literal level, we might take this looking at Renaissance artwork, which very, very much portrays God as Zeus. You see the old man in the sky with the beard from the Sistine Chapel reaching out to touch the finger of Adam. Well, the old man, the bearded old man in the sky that throws lightning bolts, that's Zeus. That is the Sky Father. His name literally means Sky Father. But the Psalms tell us, if I ascend the heights of the heavens, Lord, you're there. If I descend into the depths, behold, you're there as well. And that's not a Sky Father. That is something completely transcendent. That is not Zeus, in other words. And when we consider God's examples of Israel as the unfaithful wife, it actually calls into question, is Zeus, is the God, the Greek God that our God most resembles Zeus, or is it Hera? Hera is the God of marriage, while Zeus is the father of the gods. And they're considered in ancient Greece to be the paragons of the ideal Greek marriage, which sounds silly to us today because Zeus is constantly cheating on Hera, right? That's how the world ended up with so many demigods, was because Zeus was not a faithful husband. But in Greek culture, he wasn't expected to be a faithful husband. Hera was expected to be a faithful wife. And as the goddess of marriage, it was her job as well to punish adulterers, which is how we get this characterization of Hera being completely jealous of all of Zeus's conquests, because that was her job. As the goddess of marriage, she couldn't let adulterers off the hook, but because she was the wife of Zeus, she could not punish her husband. And that toxic patriarchal culture is what we get when we associate God with a patriarchal image like Zeus. That form of idolatry is still causing toxic masculinity and, patri and toxic patriarchy to this day. That's one form of idolatry. That is, on the very literal level, idolatry. The other thing is taking scripture far too literally, because sometimes we look to this Bible and we say, well, this is the word of God. Strictly speaking, the word of God is Jesus. At the start of John's gospel, he said, in the beginning, there was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And the word put on flesh and lived among us. The Bible didn't do that. Jesus did. Jesus is the word of God. And when Jesus ascended to heaven, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. He didn't say unto the Bible. He said, unto Jesus it has been given. So the Bible, when we take it far too literally, also has a tendency to become an idol. And these are the two forms of idolatry that I want to address. And... One of the ways we often take the Bible far too literally is when you hear preachers, like myself, saying that the Bible is an excellent guide to having a healthy and happy marriage. If you've never sat through a sermon in a conservative church, let me tell you, this, this comes out perennially. And I have to wonder if they've read the Bible, if they're making that claim, because there aren't a whole lot of passages that talk about healthy, happy marriages in the Bible. There are a lot of passages that talk about marriages gone wrong. And I want to show that they don't actually apply to marriage at all. Let's start in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 22. This is one that was quoted to Jesus. 
It says, if a man is discovered in bed with a married woman, both the man lying in bed with the woman and the woman herself must die. In this way, you will purge the evil from Israel. Now, of course, you're probably thinking of John chapter 8. I know I was when I read this. John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, it says, Early in the morning, Jesus came to the temple courts, and the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The experts in the law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught committing adultery. Now, isn't this odd? She's been caught committing adultery. Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's in the temple courts. He's in the middle of a big city. And in this case, the law applying to this woman is Deuteronomy chapter 22, and it says, if a man is discovered in bed with a married woman, it starts with that phrase. And then it continues, both shall be put to death. So just keep that in mind when Jesus starts writing in the sand. They made her stand in front of them and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery in the law of Moses, it commanded us to stone to death such women. Is that what the law of Moses just said? Keep in mind, under Roman law, men can't be held accountable for their adultery. Only women can. Only Hera can. Zeus is above the law. Are they really quoting the law of Moses here? They're quoting Roman law, and they're selling it as the law of Moses, as so often we preachers do. What then do you say? But, let me interject here. Mm -hmm. But if that's what preachers do, mm -hmm. then we've been left wrong. wrong. Oh, yes. Because I can recall growing up that everything emanated from the Bible. Mm-hmm. And the preachers that we had, at least the preacher that I knew, would always hold up the Bible and said, this is the word and this mm -hmm. is what you need to believe in. So, um, I mean, it, it took me this long to, to realize that. I mean, it, it's important that we quote mind. it correctly, right? Yeah. Because they're not quoting it correctly. They're quoting Roman law to Jesus. They're yeah. saying, we found this woman. And she needs to be stoned to death. That's that's the Roman way of doing things. That's not the Bible. Yeah, but you see, that's really devious because when we're little and we're trying mm -hmm. to learn, uh, you know, learn our Sunday school and all this kind of stuff that we're taught, we're believing it. Yeah. I mean, we're believing everything that the priest, uh, our pastor, is saying mm -hmm. without knowing, you know, the, the truth of the matter. You mm -hmm. know. And I'd say, don't believe every word that comes yeah. out of my mouth. <laughs> Test it against the scriptures. That's what I'm trying to do today. Yeah. <laughs> I'm grateful for that. <laughs> so, what then do you say? Jesus bent down and wrote on the ground, and I would say what he's writing is Deuteronomy chapter 22, which starts, if a man is discovered. Those are the very first words he's writing down. Those are the very first words they're seeing him write. He wrote on the ground with his finger. When they persisted in asking him, he stood up straight and replied, Whoever among you is guiltless may be the first to throw a stone at her. Then he bent over again and wrote on the ground. Now, if he's writing this passage on the ground, that makes a lot of sense because it starts if a man is caught and it finishes, let both of them be stoned to death. They have only brought one person. Now, when they heard this, they began to drift away one at a time, starting with the older ones, until Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Starting with the older ones. Because, you know, the longer you've lived, the more you know you're not perfect. And you know teenagers always think they are. Teenagers are invincible and perfect. And they're going to be the ones that really need to look deep inside to find out they're not. But us old folks, we know. We know. 
Jesus stood up straight and said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She replied, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go, and from now on, do not sin anymore. Quite often we have a heart full, a head full of scripture and a heart that's lacking Jesus. And when our knowledge of scripture contradicts that heart of Jesus, we have to lead with our hearts. And this is the challenge of these passages. Because as you can see, they're not being quoted faithfully. We'll move on to another challenging passage in Matthew chapter 19. It says in verse 3, Some Pharisees came to him, that would be Jesus, to test him. They asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Now in Jesus' day, this was a common debate. There was one school of thought that said, no, only sexual immorality was grounds for divorce. And another, which said that, as it says in Deuteronomy, if a man finds an indecency with his wife, any indecency. And so the school of thought said, well, any indecency could be anything. It could be that... Um, it could be that she burned the, meat, the, the dinner that she was cooking. It could be that she no longer found favor in his eyes because there was someone younger and, well, he wants to be Zeus today. And so he could write her a certificate of divorce and send her away. They're quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 5. But Jesus doesn't quote that to them. He doesn't even engage in their argument with the same scripture. He says, haven't you read that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female, and that for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let, let, let no one separate. <laughs> He's quoting Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. They reply, why then did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Now the phrasing is really strange. They say that Moses commanded that they do this. They say that Moses commanded them to have divorces. In other words, they're not only saying they can divorce their wives for any indecency, they're saying that it is good and righteous that they do so. <sighs> Once again, their God is, they're treating their God like Hera. <sighs> Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not like this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. He raises the bar because they have set it all the way at the ground level. He says that you can't just artificially lower this. Divorce is not an act of righteousness. It is the breaking of a relationship. It is a traumatic thing. And it's not really what God wants. It's not what he established. And if you're wondering, well, why is this all about the men? Look at Exodus chapter 21, verses 7 through 11, where it tells that if a man doesn't provide for his wife, and if he buys a woman as a slave, he must treat her as a wife if he buys, him, buys her for himself, or as a daughter if he buys her for his son. <laughs> She must be afforded all the rights and privileges of a wife or a daughter. He cannot buy her as a slave. And then, if he doesn't provide for her, he can't divorce her, by the way. He can't sell her. She's not really a slave. 
but he bought her as one, so he can't divorce her. But if he doesn't provide her and he marries another woman and doesn't provide for the one that he started with, she can leave him. She can leave him? She can leave him if he does not provide for her. He is obligated to provide. And if he doesn't, she can go find someone who will. <laughs> because he hasn't been found. He, well, he has been found indecent, in other words. <laughs> and in Jewish culture, this was a matter of equality. It was supposed to be. But by Jesus' time, they had lived in Greek and Roman culture for so long that they had forgotten this. So then we come back. Now that we have this established, I want to turn to Jeremiah chapter 3. And in verse 6, here is that analogy, because we have the cultural background finally to understand it. It says, when King Josiah was king of Judah, the Lord said to me, that would be Jeremiah, Jeremiah, you have no doubt seen what wayward Israel has done. You have seen how she went up to every high hill and under every green tree to give herself like a prostitute to other gods. Yet even after she had done all that, I thought that she might come back to me. But she did not. Her sister, unfaithful Judah, saw what she did. She also saw that because of wayward Israel's adulterous worship of other gods, I sent her away and gave her divorce papers. He's talking about the um, invasion of Assyria into the northern kingdom of Israel. Excuse me, I've lost my place. Here we go. But still her unfaithful sister Judah was not afraid. And she too went and gave herself like a prostitute to other gods because she took her prostitution so lightly she defiled the land through her adulterous worship of gods made of wood and stone. In spite of all this, Israel's sister, unfaithful Judah, has not turned back to me with any sincerity. She has only pretended to do so, says the Lord. Then the Lord said to me, under the circumstances, wayward Israel could even be considered less guilty than unfaithful Judah. Right from the start, we see that God is love. Jesus quoted Genesis to tell us this, that God wanted from day one to walk, to walk together on earth with all of humanity. But he saw that we were alone, and so he made companions for us, male and female, and all the genders in between. God wanted equality, and that's why we have these passages that frame adultery and idolatry as the same thing. Because in God's eyes, men and women are equals. Husbands and wives are supposed to be equals. And that husband-wife relationship of Adam and Eve is supposed to be the same kind of relationship, walking together as equals, that humanity and God were supposed to enjoy from the very beginning. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul tries to put this right. He tries to explain very clearly to the Corinthians, a Greek church. So you're under Roman law. You're supposed to treat your marriage like Zeus and Hera. The women are completely subjugated. The men go out and do whatever the heck they want. Uh, and no one can stop them. That's not what God wants. And Paul puts it very plainly. Listen, I know you have to obey the law. You gotta pay your taxes, right? You gotta, you gotta drive on the right side of the road. We gotta do these things. So here's how you can fulfill the law in Greece, but also live the way that God wants you to live. He says, making this concession, the husband should fulfill his obligations to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. I mean, that's right in line with what the Greeks are saying. And then he adds, in the same way, 
the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Paul is not willing to live in a world where there is no equality between men and women. And if he has to come up with some convoluted scheme that makes us equal because the world just isn't ready for that message, he's going to do it. Because the message of God is so important. The message that our God doesn't want to reign over us. Our God wants to walk side by side with us. He doesn't want followers. He doesn't want to lead. He wants to walk hand in hand. And he wants us to do the same. And that is what every one of these examples is trying to point to. But when we hold up the image of the Bible as an idol, when we say, this is the infallible word of God, and we take it only literally, and we never ask it any uncomfortable questions, we lose sight of that. We lose sight that Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is, is the one who walks hand in hand with us. And he's the one that walks hand in hand with God as well. He is the holy, infallible word. And so, if we want to take this first commandment literally, if we want to take it seriously, I should say, I am the Lord thy God. Walk hand in hand with me. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You can't walk two steps behind. You can't walk where the other gods walk because I've called you to partnership. Jesus doesn't walk with other gods. We don't either. Thou shalt not make unto thee any image or idol. Our God has his feet in the depths. He has his head in the sky. He cannot be captured by a God like Hades, who is only in the depths, or Neptune, who is only in the sea, or Zeus, who is only in the sky. That's not our God. Our God is everywhere and beyond. He is everywhere that we can be. Because not only does he cover all of this world, but he reaches to each and every one of us. And there is no God like that in all creation. That's why we can't make an image or an idol because there's not one that can capture the whole will, the whole majesty that is our God. And why do the Catholic, I mean, they have all these idols in, in the church, mm -hmm. and yet <laughs> commandment says. Of course. So there are Christian traditions that have images there are Christian traditions that put paintings on the walls and that create little statues and sometimes big statues. You've seen the big one in Rio. Yeah. That's a very big statue. Yeah. But our God is bigger. But theirs isn't because Catholicism grew out of Roman religion. It grew out of the cult of the emperor. And when the emperor said, you know, what serves my needs better than a whole bunch of gods? One God. One God, because there's only one emperor. There are a whole lot of senators, but there's only one emperor. So there should be one God. And that God should be me. Because I'm the emperor. Sounds like a Hitler. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? It sounds like a fascist. And fascists love monotheism as well. Because they can say, I'm the one God, but our God proves again and again he's bigger than any fascists. He is bigger than any Hitler. He is bigger than any Caesar. And he is bigger than any president. But when we reduce him to an idol, to a statue, well, now he's just one person. And God has never been just one person because 
the image of God, as it says in Genesis, God created humanity in God's image. In order to capture God's image, we need all of humanity. Every man, every woman, every trans person, every non, non-binary person, everyone in between, every person of color, every white person, every black person, everyone. We need men and women and everyone because God isn't one image. God is everyone. And he wants to walk hand in hand with each and every one of us.